Hi guys, welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Armando Iannucci. I'm Hannah. And I'm Fabs. We are the co-presidents of Cambridge Creatives. We are a student-run creative collective. We are curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. Just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them out in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we will read them out for you. One, bear with us if there are any technical difficulties, and two, let us know in the chat if there are any problems with hearing or seeing us. And most importantly, enjoy the Q&A. So our guest doesn't really need an introduction, but just as a little intro, Armando has been described as the hardman of political satire, satire, and he is most known for writing and directing the hit series, The Thick of It, as well as being the creator of Veep. And he most recently directed and adapted um, The Personal History of David Copperfield, starring Dev Patel. We're really honored to have this amazing writer and director speak. So my first question for you, Armando, is when did you know that you wanted to write or direct or work in the creative industries? Um, I didn't have a plan. I mean, it was comedy, really. I wanted to work in comedy. I wanted to make funny things. So I didn't really see it as a career or a job or a, I didn't have a sort of back of an envelope kind of plan. Or I just was always, as a child, I was a bit, I was a bit weird. I was like, you know, when my brothers were into... David Bowie and Rolling Stones. I was into Gustav Mahler and uh, Schubert and uh, almost as a reaction against them. So I was into classical music. I read a lot. I was quite academic, but I was obsessed with comedy and especially radio comedy. We were very lucky in the UK to have a great radio comedy tradition. And I, I, I was growing up when Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sort of burst onto the scene. And that was the first thing that made me think, oh, you can actually, you don't have to actually write jokes. You can have you can make comedy out of ideas, funny ideas, um, and uh, imagination and so on. And, you know, at school, I would, uh, I was always the joker, the one who impersonated all the teachers. Um, at university, I went to Glasgow and then to Oxford, and I was doing a PhD in English, but I was spending a lot of time writing comedy there and being, you know, stealing myself to actually go on stage and perform. And I wasn't doing stand-up, I was doing sort of weird sketches and, you know, the comedy of ideas, I suppose, um, uh, with some impressions. Um, I, and that was it. And, and I didn't really have it down as a career. In fact, I, I kind of thought that I ought to be, um, you know, sitting the civil service entrance exam or, or thinking about what I really wanted to do. Did I, did I want to be an academic? But I found this pool of um, comedy constantly. And I was writing my PhD on Milton and Paradise Lost. And it was after three years of that, mostly doing comedy, not really writing at all, when I realized that the only major revelation I'd come up with was that the opening line of Paradise Lost, of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, is the same rhythm scheme as the theme tune to the Flintstones <laughs> of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree. That's the point where I thought I ought to stop doing the Milton and try and pursue a career in comedy. And, but again, there was no main plan. I thought what you did was you go to London and you try and write or perform. And at that stage, it was stand-up was the sort of the big thing. I didn't really see myself as a stand-up performer, but I thought that's what I had to do. And I was just really lucky that back home in Glasgow, where I grew up, um, Radio Scotland were looking for some new talent, younger talent, they, they, their age group. They looked at their demographics and realised that they were about to die if they didn't get some younger listeners. So they were looking for some people in their late teens and early 20s to kind of host some music, sh new music shows. And uh, I sent them a tape of stuff I'd done. Um, I went up to see them. And I ended up, before I know, knew it, sort of presenting a kind of, along with Eddie Mayer, whatever happened to him, um, a kind of new, new music show. But I was seen as the one who was allowed to go off and do comedy. And, and, and it was a tremendous opportunity to just use the resources available. Because Radio Scotland was like a national station. So it had all the latest equipment, all the latest sound and, and um, studios. You know, had, you know, sports departments, news departments, everything, but also small enough for you to be allowed to just try a hand at everything. 
And so if I wanted to do a parody of the news, I could get a newsreader in. If I wanted to do a sports parody, I could get, you know, that lip mic that sports reporters use when they're commenting. You already, you saw already you're starting to sound like Alan Partridge when you do that. Um, and I was allowed to just use sound effects to direct actors, to start editing, work with editors. And it was a whole um, just learning experience. So that's how it started. And with that, I then applied for a job as a radio producer in London for, for Radio 4, um, which I, I got. So I ended up having a proper job, as it were, um, working at the BBC, some, producing some of the comedy shows that I'd kind of grown up listening to, which was slightly nerve wracking, but fun as well. Sounds like an amazing education, your time. In well, yeah, I mean, it's that thing of just use what's available to you. You know, I, I, I did the job at Radio Scotland thinking, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just use this building and all its facilities and see where we get to, really. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm, I asked Radio Scotland to kind of finance me to go and shadow comedy producers in London. Uh, which they did and and so I got a lot of experience out of that which you know I could bring back to Scotland but 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 also when I later applied for the job in London they knew who I was because they'd seen me you know they knew I was enthusiastic and you know they could put a face to the name and and, and so on um, so it's it's about it's about that just you know make of what you have in front of you really and and try and do a bit more with it than than you're asked to. In that respect, do you have any advice for students who would like to follow in your footsteps, whether that's going into TV or to comedy or to radio? Well, it's, um, it, yeah, as I say, it's, it's kind of always show willing, always show enthusiasm. Don't be aggressive and kind of, I think people are put off when <laughs> they get really kind of, you know, they watch too much of um, uh, uh, Dragon's Den or, no, The Apprentice and, and, and you know, I, people don't want that in the office. Um, uh, you know, if, if, for example, and I, I'm sort of restricted mainly to talking about comedy because that's my experience, but, you know, if you're a comedy writer, if you want to write comedy, don't wait to be asked. Just write. The opportunity's there. You can make stuff easily now. You can do what we're doing, you know, just use Wi-Fi and cameras and, and make stuff. Um, you can, you, uh, uh, and even if no one's reading it, keep writing because the more you write, the better you'll get. And always write for, write what makes you laugh. Don't try and put yourself in the shoes of someone else. Like, a, don't try and write what you think the head of comedy at Channel 4 will like, or the head of BBC Two will like. Write what makes you laugh because that way you're gonna write your best stuff. So do that, keep writing because you'll always improve. Um, and. And, and what is it that you like? What do you like? What shows, on, what, what programs do you like? Look at them, get the names of the production companies that make them or the producers or the writers on them. See if you can get in touch with them and you know, ask if you could come and shadow them. People are quite happy to have people shadowing them. You know, it's no real problem. Um, it might be at the moment in COVID days, there's restrictions, but you know, hopefully that will ease up. And so I'm always got, people on the set who are just there to to watch um you know and, and and ask questions just ask questions you know if you are in that sort of situation if you're on set don't be afraid to kind of talk to the sound people or to the lighting people or to the you know um just don't walk on in front of the camera that, that's that's all i ask really um in terms of writing comedy for radio how do you actually go about that do you just sit down in a room and just write everything? Oh, down? it depends what the idea is. I mean, I, I, a lot of my stuff has been very collaborative. Um, and I think it was because I started at an early stage being the producer. So therefore I'm already casting and I'm already asking writers to write for the show. So I'm, having, I'm already having a dialogue with all these people. And the first new show I did was called On The Hour, which was like a parody of a, a radio news show. And again, that started because I went on a training course. The BBC put me on a training course with lots of other journalists, reporters, uh, trainee presenters and producers. And at one point over the two weeks, we were asked to make a 10 minute magazine show. And I thought, well, I don't want to make that because I want to make comedy. So why don't I do a, a parody of a magazine show, but use the reporters and the you know documentaries and feature makers who are on this course to kind of 
contribute to it so it sounds believable. Um, so that's what I did. And, and that became the kind of pre-pilot for what then was the pilot. You know, I was asked on the back of that to make a pilot properly for Radio 4, which we called On The Hour. And then it became a, a series. So again, it's, it's just using, you know, what, what's available to you. Just think creatively about how to use it. Um, radio now is a bit more, uh, I don't even think radio is, you know, it's not necessarily a station anymore. It's, it's you know, people do podcasts. People do, as I say, it's the, the whole format thing has opened up. Um, so I find in the past, you know, it was just scripts that were coming in. So you'd have a mountain of scripts to, to look at if you were a producer. But now it's a three minute video, uh, a 10 minute podcast, uh, you know, just be inventive with it. Um, you mentioned Alan Partridge before. How did you come up with that character? Um, did anyone in particular inspire it? Um, well, it, 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 we were doing, so we were doing On The Hour and the, par uh, the, the pilot of On The Hour didn't have a sports reporter. So when we were given the go ahead to make a series, I thought, well, we need a sports reporter. We've got a weather person, a newsreader, investigative reporter. We need a sports reporter. And uh, I had assembled a group of people, including Steve Kogan, who were all good at doing lots of voices and characters and improvising and just making it very real. And I said to Steve, could you do like a sports reporter, not an impression of anyone in sp specific, but a voice that sounds like, you know, that kind of person. And he instantly, it was a bit more John Motson initially, but he and in, instantly he came out with this kind of, hello, I'm here, here I am, that sort of thing. And it was so funny because we instantly felt he was in the room. And within, within a minute, somebody said, he's Partridge. And, and then someone else said, and he's an Alan. You know, he just, bang. It was like he'd emerged fully formed, like a, a foal that's just been born and just, <laughs> just stands up and starts walking. You know, <laughs> it was just like that. It was instant, you know, and we can't actually remember who it was that said he's Partridge and who it was that said he's an Alan. It just all... He just was present in the room and for some reason we just all found him very very funny because we kind of knew maybe because we'd worked in radio as well we kind of knew these radio sports people who kind of felt a little bit like the the, the news journalists were looking down on them didn't really regard them as proper kind of broadcasters <laughs> you know the same way that PE teachers you always wonder whether the other teachers whether they worry that the other teachers look down on them as not really not really a teacher you know it's that kind of paranoia because, because it's sport you know as if that's somehow kind of, of less of less import you know uh, and kind of we like that and then very very quickly we knew that he lived in Norwich because we wanted to find somewhere that hadn't been used as a comedy place you know that actually felt kind of normal and the funny thing about Norwich which is really nice I like Norwich a lot um is it slightly out of the way? If you want a career in London, it's just slightly too far. So if you're doing local TV and radio in Norwich, but are trying to get a foot in the door in, in London, it's a lot of traveling, really. It's, 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 a, it's yeah, it's a good three hours. Um, <laughs> so we kind of like that idea. Mm. Did you find sort of with Alan Partridge taking the reality and making it hilarious prepared you for your work or for the idea of the thick of it and taking n normality um, hilarious a little bit no no yes studying what people actually say and then just slightly turning it up to 11 but also the improvisatory nature of what we did really as just as a function of i just thought with on the hour um you know we made up it was all bollocks all the stories were just made up uh, but we thought we had to tell them with a straight face and so therefore a straight kind of tone in our voice a very believable so I felt the more believable it felt and the more spontaneous and the rhythms of natural conversation it felt the funnier it would be mm. so that involved giving the cast the bare bones of the joke and the kind of things I wanted them to say but asking them to slightly say it in their own words so that it would sound slightly spontaneous and then I would edit it all together like a reporter would edit together all the interviews that they've done on the street so you've got this package that then goes up and when uh, On The Hour transferred to television as the day-to-day -day and Alan's chat show knowing me knowing you 
transfer to television. Um, we, you know, we, we carry that on. So we, we always work with actors who are very comfortable with improvising. And it's not that what you see on the screen is being improvised, it's all written, but the process of writing it is done with the performers in a kind of rehearsal room, um, workshopping ideas and then rewriting it and then workshopping it again and then rewriting it and so on until you arrive at this script because the cameras need to know who's going to say what when uh, and it is in front of an audience so we can't be kind of pausing and trying to work out what to do next so there's all that but behind it has been a kind of much more collaborative process so I think I took that uh, that process into the thick of it because again when I was doing the thick of it I wanted to make it feel like yes this is all being acted and these are performers but the audience I, I kind of wanted them to think this must be what it, it's really like because it feels real it feels like we're kind of watching something we shouldn't really be allowed we're not really allowed into these rooms and somehow we've been allowed in and we're kind of seeing what really happens so that's what I wanted to carry over into that did that sort of reality inform your decision to have the sort of handheld camera style yes uh, it was partly that it was partly budget it, uh, i mean the thing of it started really as an experiment it was when bbc4 was starting up uh and it was a very very low budget channel digital channel low small audience um and the controller at the time roller keating i approached him and said look i'd like to do kind of an updated yes minister but here's how i see it i see it's about I think it's about the minister and his advisors and the media and then the the enforcer from number 10 who tells them what they're really going to do and what they can't say and what they should say and all that this sort of centralized control from number 10 um but let, we'll need to make it really cheap if i can get a set of empty offices we'll light it in a general lighting state so we're not having to normally when you're filming you film one way and then you have to stop and then move all the lights around to film the other way. So that when you're seeing a two way kind of uh, scene, it's been shot two different times. And then you, you pull back and you shoot it all again from a while. And I, I don't have time for that. So if we shoot it all, if we light it all in one general state, so we're not having to change the lighting all the time, we have all the cameras handheld so they can get out of each other's way. We have the actors radio mic'd up so they can wander. We're not giving them marks that they have to hit. So it's almost like a documentary. I mean, they've got the script, they've learned the script, but we're going to shoot it like these are people in the documentary. And actually to start with, I chose uh, a camera team who were used to doing documentaries so that they were used to trying to find out wh who the person was that was speaking or, or where the moment was and then go run up and try and grab it. And so we did that and we shot in nine days, this disused set of offices, we shot three half hour episodes in nine days um, for not that much money. Um, and the joy of that was the BBC liked it, but of course they've now got, they've got three episodes. They immediately said, well, if you do another three, we've got a series of six, so we can put it out on BBC two as a, as a series. So that's what we did. So that's how that happened. So partly the style of it was to do with the, the verite that I was trying to get, the fact that this, this is really what it's like, this frantic kind of make it up as you go along because you haven't got time to think kind of atmosphere that I, you know, found out as I was researching was, was the norm. Um, who'd have thought that government's making it up as they go along? I mean, today we can see how actually it's a series of carefully thought through measures uh, based very much not just on the science, but on kind of a wide and deep level of research and thought. Um, but when I was making think of it, uh, I wanted to capture that fact that it was all completely made up and nobody knew what they were doing and were just lucky to get through the day without being caught. Um, so it was that and the budget. So it was the style of it, you know, that dictated the tone and the tone was also dictated by the fact that we didn't have very much money all the time. Perfect combination. Yes. <laughs> uh, it sounds like you gave the actors a lot of freedom in terms of improvisation yes. and allowing them to swear. Do you have any favorite memories from set where there was the perfect improvised moment well right in the um the, the first episode 
where um, so the minister Hugh Abbott, played by Chris Langham, thinks that he's got the go-ahead to an announce a policy, and he summoned all the education correspondents from the press to a school in I think a school in Worcester where he's going to announce this policy. But in the car on the way, Malcolm Tucker, played by Peter Capaldi, tells him that the Treasury has ditched it, they're against the idea, and uh, he can't announce the policy. And he says, well, I've got the press there, what am I going to announce? And Malcolm says, over to you. Uh, and in the car journey, they have to think of a policy that doesn't cost anything and won't cause a fuss that he can announce. Now, as we were we filmed the scene, but we had a little bit of time to spare. And I had the actors in the back of the car. We had the camera. And I said, well, why don't you just improvise some policies? <laughs> and, and so we improvised it. And three of them that made it into the final cut within about five years had become law. And they were, everyone has to have their own plastic bag permanently, pet asbos. And uh, Chris Addison's character, Chris Addison came up with a national spare room database, which very soon became the bedroom tax. And I have been at a couple of functions, sort of Royal Television Society functions and so on, where there was a cabinet minister, the then culture secretary was opposite me, and he leaned over and he said, I've been in the back of that car. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of quite, so, so, there was, so there was that that I kind of remember that, you know, it's always strange because we actually do a lot of research, but we're not actually out to do stories that, genuinely happen we just do the research to try and get the the detail right you know what time does the minister get in who's the first person the minister speaks to if the editor of the daily mail rang the office who would take the call and all that sort of thing and then we make up our stupid stories but then you find out about a week later someone in politics says how did you find that out we thought we kept that quiet and you think what that really <laughs> happened you know that's that's the kind of sad sad truth that we kind of encounter do you have civil servants coming up to you with a sense of solidarity that you understand them well or do you... yeah i mean it's not just civil servants i mean yeah the civil the, the kind of permanent civil servants there uh there but they're very discreet they're, if anything they're the ones who want i mean it's politicians and and politicals who are the most indiscreet of all really i don't know why it is but they well i did remember going to being invited to do the uh, the address address the haggis uh, at uh, a Burns supper at the treasury and this was when Gordon Brown was chancellor and the newspapers were full of the rows that were going on between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown and how it was just paralyzing government and so on and I was there to, to give the kind of speech and and on the invite it said you know and we'll give you we'll give you endless stories about Blair and Brown unbelievable stuff you know, and that was from Brown's senior advisor. You know, <laughs> very gossipy, very gossipy. It's, yeah. it's, there's a sort of sense of them um, kind of, I think they kind of like it. I think they like it when television wants to do, uh, dramatise their side of it because they see it's kind of quite exciting. They're quite excited by showbiz um, in, in a way that they'll clam up if it's just a political journalist asking questions. But if it's showbiz, they, they kind of want to show you around. When we were doing In The Loop, which was a kind of spin-off film of uh, The Thick Of It, we were allowed into number 10 to film. And they've never done that. They've never done any drama filming at number 10. But the film opens with Malcolm coming out of number 10 on the phone, walking down Downing Street. And they let us do it. But the, the price we had to pay was we had to go round number 10 and meet all the advisors and shake hands and have photos of Malcolm trying to punch him. Or, you know, it was crazy. That's so interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Going back to the thick of it slightly, did you ever have yeah. a character? When I watch it, I'm like, oh, I have a soft spot for this person and this person. Mm. Do you ever have one character that you had a secret soft spot when you were writing it? Well, I always, but Glenn is such a loyalist, you know, and, and, and he has a hard, hard time. So I kind of always liked to see Glenn kind of just try and fight his corner because he never really does it terribly well. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a soft spot. Yeah. Um, it just talking about the kind of their obsession with showbiz, it, it happened in America as well because when we were researching Veep, mm -hmm. the vice president's office 
we got tremendous um, uh, uh, opportunity to speak to uh, Al Gore, um, Al Gore's uh, chief of staff. Um, and then we were shown around the White House by Obama's sort of body man, who's, who's sort of his chief aide, who's called Reggie Love, who's about six foot six. And has a big because you all have your surname on your badge. Just had love written on, <laughs> going around high fiving. But he'd show it around the West Wing, but he would reference the TV show The West Wing. So he'd say, "This is the Roosevelt Room. This would be where CJ and Josh would sit and discuss uh, the president's speech." And I'm thinking, "But why are you referencing the fictional character? You are. This is real. You are. You are in the. You are CJ and Josh and." Why don't you say this is the Roosevelt Room? This is where Barack Obama, the president, would sit with his Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Why do it, it was it was like actually they were much more interested in the the TV showbiz version of their lives, and they got really quite starry eyed and giddy when when you know TV came calling. Yeah, it doesn't bode well for future politics if they're taking inspiration from West Wing. Um, oh no, well, <laughs> West Wing, West Wing's set in an ideal world when they're all good at their job. So I mean, we'll, we'll, we will never see it's like again. <laughs> Speaking of that, um, yeah. do you ever look at current political events and think, oh, I'm itching to take up the pen and write and take the mic? Well, not, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always asked if I want to do a Brexit thick of it or a COVID thick of it, and I don't really. I, I find at the moment it's so... Um, it's so kind of crossed the line. It's sort of jumped the shark politics now. It's so unbelievable. And the people in charge are so, um, you know, when the president says, I could shoot someone in the face in Fifth Avenue and still get elected, then there are no rules anymore. And, and the sort of comedy that we did in the thick of it and so on was all about, it assumed there were a set of rules. And here's how certain people try and twist the rules and occasionally break them. But if there are no rules, you can't really do that anymore. You don't have anything to play with. <laughs> um, so I think it's interesting that the comedians are, ha are making more of a mark addressing, say, Trump, are actually the ones who do less the fiction and more the journalism, the hard factual investigation, like John Oliver. and The MASH report does it a bit as well, actually. And that sense of, OK, if the politicians are acting like the entertainers, we, the comedians, will act like the journalists and actually lay out the facts in some kind of hilarious order, but they are the facts. Uh, I think that's where we are at the moment. Mm. Um, returning to the thick of it one last time, yeah. what were some yeah. of your favourite memories from set? There are so many different eclectic scenes. Do you have one that stands uh, out? Uh, I, there, I remember there's the scene in uh, the penultimate season where Malcolm is having a bit of a breakdown and he's in a glass, he's in a glass office and he's having a real go, I think it's Terry, he's having a real go at Terry, but it's meant to be a kind of a whole series of non sequiturs. And what I did was I got three or four different writers to write three or four different speeches. And then I randomly chose sentences from those four speeches and stitched them together. So it was just a stream of verbal, dissociation really just nonsense really poor peter had to then go and learn it and <laughs> my abiding memory of the thick of it is peter in in because we were in these these old uh, disused offices there were lots of glass offices and peter had an office where he would just go and learn his malcolm rants and he had to learn them absolutely word perfect because when he's doing them he can't show any amount of hesitation uh, but they're so full of swearing so all day you would just see peter pacing up and down a room swearing at the top of his voice trying to get this because he said the be the only way he could learn it was sort of almost like muscle memory on his mouth so it would just spurt out but when when Malcolm was doing this scene where he was having this enormous big sort of meltdown um, everyone else in the cast wanted to see it so it was so funny people just gradually gathered around the monitors outside this glass booth well well Peter and, and Joe Scanlon as Terry <laughs> were, were in this kind of glass cage being watched by all of us kind of like with cameras and kind of just watching that's one of my memories that I remember yeah Sounds amazing um did you find that your work on in the loop then helped you with Veep because you had this sort of Anglo-American yeah. yes it sort of led to it I mean the, the idea with uh, in the loop was it was a it, it was 
a par not a parody, a, a satire or a, a look at Britain and America going to war. So it was inspired very directly by the Gulf War. And it involved me going out to Washington and doing research there speaking to the CIA, to the um, Pentagon, uh, State Department, um, and t t terrible, thing. again, they want to offload, they're happy to tell you. And, you know, someone in the CIA said, in the end, they found they were getting their best intelligence from just reading the Baghdad newspapers. They said it was far more accurate than anything any of their people on the ground were telling them. Um, uh, uh, and uh, and also it, it helped me, um, that was my first taste of actually working with American actors, you know, casting in America and working with, and working with American crew for the American scenes. Um, so as a result of doing that, you know, HBO came calling and said, look, we've been trying to do an American uh, politics show for a while. We've tried drama, we've tried comedy, nothing's quite taken off, but, um, uh, and, and in the loop, we were very lucky in the loop, the script for it got an Oscar nomination. So that, that kind of immediately kind of gave us that, um, that, that um, sense of, you know, you can have, you can, you can start having meetings in, in, uh, in, in LA, <laughs> this meeting culture that goes on there. Um, uh, and so I said, okay, yeah, I'd love to. And I was a huge fan of, HBO anyway, The Sopranos. One of my all time favorite shows is The Larry Sanders Show, which is a parody, a sort of behind the scenes of a chat show, a late night chat show. Um, but done very, very real. It sort of inspired The Thick of It because I always thought The Thick of It would be in the style of The Larry Sanders Show in terms of how they made it very verite. They made the, act, the characters all very real, not necessarily likable, they had no qualms about the language. It just felt true. And I, and I applied that to the thick of it. So actually HBO saying, do you want to do something for us? I kind of felt like this felt like, um, you know, where I've always wanted to be. So um, yes, and they were very, um, they're very supportive. And, and you, you discover actually, I think they're great. Um, key to their success is they're not that big HBO. I always had in my head HBO as this massive kind of imposing company uh, full of quite aggressive frightening people and in fact it's not it's it's <laughs> the, the key program people the key people who decide the programs there's about half a dozen of them and they're all they all just want it to be good really they just want it they're not interested in advertising. They don't do advertising. They're just interested in subscriptions. And in order to get subscriptions, they've got to persuade people it's worth paying money for really good shows. So they just need their shows to be really good. There's no dumbing down. There's no sense of how can we make this have a mass appeal. That doesn't interest them. All that interests them is the show being as good as it can be. So if they do give you notes and advice, it's all towards trying to make it even better. Um, rather than silly suggestions about, you know, that you hear about big studios kind of handing notes on. So, and it's great. It's absolutely, and I think that's, they don't make much. They only make about 30 or 40 shows in a year. They don't, they're not like Netflix or just piling out 500 of them. Um, so they all have to have this quality control. And that was a great kind of eye opener in a way, really, that you can, you can actually do it. You don't have to buy into this in order to be successful, it has to be pitched at the lowest common denominator. And look what's happening now. I mean, television is going through this golden age where all television has to be good now. Otherwise, we won't watch it. Um, so it's, it's, it's good. I don't know why I got onto this subject. You were asking. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, in the loop led to. Yes. So HBO. Um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to set in Washington, but I didn't know was it going to be a senator, someone at Congress, maybe a governor, if we wanted to get away from Washington, a secretary of state, you know. And then I thought about the vice president and I thought, I read this enormous book, Robert Carroll's biography of Lyndon, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, which is now four volumes, each of about a thousand pages. And Johnson has just become president. So there's still a long way to go. Um, and everyone's praying that Cairo writes it before he dies because he's quite elderly now. Um, 
but it was an interesting eye opener because Johnson, I didn't realize, was actually the Senate majority leader. And he was a powerful Senate leader, powerful senator, very persuasive, very into the old fashioned, you know, grabbing people in the huddle and we can work this out, you know, we can reach a, we can do a deal. Um, so a really powerful, got in the late 50s, got a civil rights, the, the beginnings of a civil rights act through, uh, which was unheard of at the time. Um, so this most powerful person, Kennedy asked him to become his vice president and Johnson had already tried to run as president and didn't get very far. And he just thought, what have I got to lose? You know, I'm not going to be able to become president myself. And he did the, he did the math. Um, he, he looked at, and he saw one in four presidents become president, uh, having been vice president. And one in four, at the time, one in four presidents die in office. So he did the thought, well, I've got one four chance, which is why all the conspiracy theories then grew up when Kennedy was shot, was it Johnson? And it was just like, but what was interesting was this very powerful senator, suddenly as, as Kennedy's vice president, literally sitting in his office, drumming his hands on the desk, asking, did the president call? I mean, completely sidelined, powerless, a joke, people laughing behind his back. He knew that people were laughing. He felt embarrassed. He felt small. He felt belittled. And yet, three years later, the most powerful man in the world. Um, mm. So it's that so close and yet so far and yet so close that, I, that there's a sort of comic, comic uh, mechanism there that the, 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 the fact that a vice president would be prepared to kind of humiliate themselves in a way, if it just means they stand a chance in three years time, in eight years time, who knows, mm. you know, just holding on to that kind of, always in the distance, but, but not so far away that you can't grab it kind of um, prize that's, that's in front of them. Yeah. So, and then we thought we'll make it a female vice president because we didn't want people to think, is it meant to be Al Gore? Is it meant to be Dick Cheney? Let's think, forward rather than backward there's bound to be either a female president or female vice president very soon and just at that time Sarah Palin was chosen by so everyone then thought is it about Sarah Palin then people thought is it about Hillary Clinton and we were saying no it's just it's Selena Meyer you know that's who it is um and and and, and she was a former senator and so clearly had had some kind of electoral success and some kind of um reputation but now finds herself in this kind of slightly diminished frustrating role that she's now trying to reinvent and try and make something of amazing um you recently said that you were glad to leave veep in 2015 why is that and and was it just that you you wanted to enjoy it as an audience member or move i did I, I mean i'd done four seasons of it it involved me being away from home we we wrote it here in the UK and all the directors were British and we, we edited it in the UK. So it was a British production, but we shot it uh, out in Baltimore, which is about 30 miles from Washington DC. It's in Maryland. Um, uh, uh, and it was a great place to shoot and the crews there were great. It's an American crew, obviously, American cast, obviously. Um, and, and it was a great experience, but you know, it, I, I didn't want to move out to America. I didn't want to uproot the family um, so I was doing a lot of backwards and forwards I was getting lots of jet lag and it never gets better jet lag um, it, get, it just gets worse and worse so I felt like a zombie by the end but I also felt after four seasons I'd never done so many episodes of, of a project before you know I'd, by the end of four seasons I'd done 40 episodes and I thought I'd taken it to where I wanted to do you know take it I knew I wanted to make another film after In the Loop I thought it would be about two or three years and then I'd do my next film. I didn't expect Veep to kind of take off really and it become this, and, and in season four was the one where we won the Emmy for best comedy. So it felt like a good time to leave. Um, and I left Dave Mandel who took over, I left him with this constitutional conundrum because my final episode ends with the election, Selena's running for president and it's an electoral college tie. So they can't decide the winner. And that for me was my final statement on American politics, the absolute deadlock and logjam. 
and I left it for Dave Mandel and his American team to try and sort it out, which they did for the next three seasons. Um, but then, so I felt it was the right time to do that. Um, and then when Trump got in, I thought very much it was the right time to do it because, it, it, as I said, Trump's impossible. You can't do a fictionalized version of Trump that doesn't, it, any fictionalized version will come nowhere near um, what Trump actually is in terms of his kind of madness and uh, unpredictability. You cannot predict his unpredictability, really. Um, so I was kind of, and I knew I was go about to do the death of Stalin. That, that had been looming and I'd have been approached about it and I'd agreed to do it while I was doing season three of Veep. And I said, you know, I've got one more season of Veep to do. And they said, well, well, we'll wait. So I knew I was going on to do the death of Stalin after, after season four. Speaking of films and Death of Stalin then, um, yeah. you often co-write or write and direct your own project. Yeah. Is that a combination that you really like? Well, that's what I thought I'd do. But Death of Stalin, strangely, was another person. I mean, it was a graphic novel. It was a French graphic novel uh, based on the events surrounding the death. So based on a lot of historic uh, events, but it had that structure of a, of a, of a, of a story. Uh, and I was just instantly, funnily enough, I'd been thinking at the time of doing my own project based on a fictional dictator, because I was kind of interested in the rise of authoritarianism across Europe. This was pre-Trump. Um, but, you know, it was, it was on the rise. And, and then when I read the book, I thought, well, this is all true. Why don't I do this? Because this is true. Um, so it was that. And so I found myself actually as my second film doing an adaptation of someone else's work and then going on to do with David Copperfield, you know, for the third film, an adaptation of someone else's work. So I kind of like, kind of like coming across other people's um, stories. And the challenge is how do you make that into a movie? How do you, you know, how do you preserve the essence of what it was that excited you about it? But on the other hand, you've got to make it stand on its own as its own thing. You, know, you mustn't be too, I, particularly with Copperfield, I felt, um, you know, it's preserving the kind of the energy and inventiveness and the language in the book. But at the same time, it's an 800 page novel. And if you just try and tell that story point by point, it will be a tedious, very episodic thing. It has to have a beginning, a middle and an end. So the biggest liberty we took was with the storyline really and reshaping that but trying to preserve the essence of the uh, originality of the of this of the, of the book and the, and the language and the co comedy bringing out the comedy which i hadn't seen done so much in, in other adaptations mm. you speak about bringing about bringing out comedy when you were directing the cast how did you make what is quite dark material really comedic in parts and was that fun how well, did it was, react it was going back to the book and digging out the comedic material i mean there's lots of really funny stuff there that i hadn't seen in adaptations there was you know the D dickens describing david's first time drunk and everything swirling around him and then looking in the mirror and go i've got drunken hair and <laughs> and it, it was like the scene in um the Wolves of Wall Street, where they're on drugs and are crawling along the floor. I mean, Dickens describes David as sort of crawling up the stairs and the wooziness of it, of that first time that you're drunk, wondering what the hell is happening. It's really funny. Lots of really funny stuff there. And I think it's because people were obsessed with just telling the story that everything else, all the, all the tangential stuff, like the humour and the jokes, just got binned. And I wanted to put them back in. In the book, Dickens falls in love with Dora and is obsessed with her, so he imagines seeing her curls and her name everywhere around him. And we've got in the film, you know, he sees it, her name written in the clouds and her curls are on St Paul's Cathedral and stuff. But that's inspired by the book. So we just, and very often when people quote stuff back at us, I have to say, well, that's, that's Dickens you're quoting because that's, that's there in the book. And I think it just, people forget how funny Dickens is, really. Yeah. Uh, he's seen as this rather bloated, verbose Victorian novelist who writes about mud and fog and death. But in fact, a lot of his books are very, very comical. Yeah. With Death of Stalin, which is obviously the opposite, it's actually quite like yeah. inherently dark. Yeah. Putting the comedy into that and getting the cast to put the comedy into that. Yeah. Was that a different... Did you, it require a different approach? Um, it, I knew that 
uh, I knew I wanted it to be funny, but I knew that we had to be very respectful of actually what did happen to the people in the Soviet Union. You know, there were millions of deaths. Uh, and we weren't going to make fun of that. We were going to show that for real if we did show it. We weren't going to hide it. So the comedy was more about the behavior of these people in the Kremlin. And then you see the consequences, the real tragic consequences of that outside. But I think the real trying to get that mix of comedy and uh, darkness. We did a long rehearsal period, so everyone got to know each other, and we, you know, we we did all the kind of choreographing of the funeral and stuff, and um, so we were able to do all that. But I knew that actually it was going to be a long edit because in the edit, that's where I had to make sure every minute justified its presence. So if it was funny, you could see why it was in the film. And also if there was a dark moment coming up that the comedy wasn't going to undercut the, the tragedy or the tragedy wasn't going to kind of bring down the comedy. It was a kind of bit of a tightrope walk. Um, but, you know, when you do a film, you go out apart from under today's circumstances, but when the cinemas are open, you take a film out, you have to go out and sell it. So you screen it, you do a Q and A with the audience. So you meet your audience when you do a film. And with the death of Stalin, taking it around the world, I met lots of people who had grown up under Stalin or who maybe have lost their parents or their grandparents. You know, so I was, you know, I was meeting people who had lived through it. And they all of them said, it's true. What we saw on the screen was true. You know, and you've got to do it as a comedy because it was so absurd. All logic had gone out the window. We knew at the time it was absurd. I mean, they told us how they used to circulate joke books about Stalin, very dark jokes about Stalin, that if a neighbor reported you for, for telling the joke, you could be shot. And yet people still felt the need to turn it into a joke because, you know, it's like they're saying, he can come, he can take my business away, he can take my family away, he can take my freedom away, but if I can still make fun of him, he hasn't shut my brain down. Um, and I think that's why dictators or authoritarians don't like don't like jokes about themselves but they don't like any kind of culture that they can't control mm. i think that's why um artists have, have managed to get away for so long by doing doing stories that are allegories or are you know that they're, they're not ob objectively about the person but there's a story there that touches on themes about the person and I think dictators and authoritarians don't like the fact that they don't know how an audience is going to respond they can't control how an audience responds to a joke they can't stop you laughing um, and they don't like that they don't like that kind of unpredictability really they like everything to be absolutely measured and you know so they know what's coming on a lighter note and um, for both <laughs> <laughs> for both Death of Stalin and for David Copperfield, you had amazing, immense casts with um, yeah. sort of national treasures. What was it like directing them? And do you have any favourite moments with, with your casts? I do remember, you know, the likes of Steve Buscemi and Michael Palin and uh, uh, Simon Russell Beale in the rehearsal room carrying a dummy of Stalin. It, and, and I was working out how to do it in such a way that the urine on Stalin's body will end up um, smudging itself onto Paul Whitehouse's face. <laughs> and that took, that took a kind of half a day of working that out. And it was just hysterical to watch. I mean, everyone knew, and, there's, and there's a lot of them were, you know, some of these people are quite elderly, some of these people, uh, and, and they were just all, and, and kind of grown up. And, you know, there's Simon Russell Beale, you know, our greatest stage actor. <laughs> just were carrying a dummy around and trying to get piss on Paul Whitehouse's face. And I think we just all, just all, we all thought, what are we doing? What is this saying? And yet at the same time, funny, very funny. So I remember that. Um, and I remember, you know, when we were rehearsing David Copperfield, there's a scene in the film where they try and hide drink from Mr. Wickfield, played by Ben, ben Wong. It's in a kind of a globe atlas thing. And again, we spent half a day in a kind of church hall just finding out as many ways as possible we could hide this globe from him when he turned and 
and so on. And again, but it's like you've got Tilda Swinton and Dev Patel and Hugh Laurie doing this kind of crazy pantomime stuff. It's uh, it's it's funny when you kind of step out and just think, what was that all about? <laughs> Sounds amazing. Um, specifically for David Copperfield, you had such a diverse cast which sort of represented mm -hmm. the British day. How important was it to you to sort of change the, the look of a period drama and make it more? Well, I always thought, you know, I didn't want to do a traditional costume drama. And I said to the cast and the crew when we started, let's pretend no one's ever made a costume drama and therefore there are no rules. And there are no expectations as to how it's made. We'll just make it the way we want. Because I wanted it to feel fresh and new and alive. And it's happening now. It's not happening in the past. Because the people in it are living in their present day. Their present day for them is 1840. But, but that's the, their present day. They don't think they're in the past. So they should feel alive and the whole future is ahead of them. Um, but the other thing was I could only think of Dev to play David. I, he, I just couldn't think of anyone else he just for me so matched what i wanted from david the spirit and energy and um hope and charisma and comedy and romance and slapstick and um physicality and and you know there's just something about dev that just makes you want him to win um and he's so um inhabited for me uh, the, the character that i i, I was uh, very grateful he said yes because I didn't really have a plan B but it then made me think well I've chosen Dev because I just wanted to choose the actor who I think best inhabits the spirit of the character and that's how I should choose that's how I should cast every character really um, so it wasn't really a big thing it was just a kind of you know why can't I cast from 100% of the acting community available to us um, and Dev said you know, are, are you sure you want to do this? Because you normally, if this was David Copperfield, Dave actually said, I'd be the guy at the back holding a tray of tea. You know, I'd be playing the servant, you know, if you wanted to get kind of how it was then. And I said, yeah, but yeah, but we can't, this, this film has to feel, this has to connect now. It has to connect with our audience now. For me, it's about showing, especially after all the last three years of Brexit, I don't want the world to think of Britain as being an isolated, inward looking, um, unimaginative island. For me, Britain is an open, generous, kind hearted, uh, humorous, and welcoming place. And I want to celebrate that. And the book itself is all about community and it's all about, it's all about identity. The whole film is about David trying to work out who he is and being called different names by different people. And, trying to behave in different ways with whichever environment he's in. And we, Dev and I talked about maybe when it was written, it was all about class and, and you were worried if you were marginalized, you weren't in the right class or you weren't making the right income. Maybe today ethnicity comes into it. You know, Dev and I are both British born children of, of, of immigrant parents. And we grew up with that just slight sense of, are we in? Are we out? Do we belong? Are we separate? You know, and, and the answer is you're everything really, you know, you, you're part of it, but you also have your own kind of cultural heritage that's, you know, I'm, I, I've, I've been an Italian in Scotland, a Scot in England and a Brit in America. You know, I'm constantly <laughs> slightly wondering where I stand and all this. So I, I for, for that reason, and we made the film I I just thought it was how you make it, how we should go about it I didn't really think it was anything it's something that's been going on in theatre for the last 20 years I didn't really think I didn't think long and hard about it I just thought that's how I wanted to cast the film we shot the film two years ago um, now of course it has this relevance and even today or yesterday the BBC announcing it's now going to think but how it represents diversity in its programming. And it's, it's very basic, really. It's just cast from everyone available to you. Don't, don't have a preconception of what type of person should be playing that character. And I do it with writing as well. If I'm looking for new writers, I just ask for the best scripts from uh, writing agencies. And I say, take the names off. I don't want to see the names. So I'm purely reading it on the quality of the material. I don't know if someone is old or young or what gender, what, 
geographically where the I, I, none of that. I just I just want to read the stuff and and um, and, and and that's that's I think how you do it really. Um, we're going to have some questions from the audience soon. Uh -huh. Our final question, whilst people type their questions into the Q and A box, not the chat box, um, oh, okay. is: Do you have any TV or film recommendations to fill lockdown or lack of? Well, lockdown? I love this film. There's a uh, Italian director from the sort of 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, Vittoria De Sica, who uh, is part of the Italian neorealist movement. But ignore I even said that. Yeah. Um, and, and his most famous film was Bicycle Thieves, which, you know, in all those poll of polls, critics' top 100s is usually in the top 10. And it's a fantastic film. I'd recommend that. However, I then saw the film he made after it, which is called Miracle in Milan. And it's hilarious. It's gobsmackingly good. It's really, it still has a lot of, it's all about poverty as is um, the Bicycle Thieves. But the Bicycle Thieves is a very naturalistic, uh, very bittersweet story. Miracle of Milan is a happy story, but it's still set, it's very honest about poverty uh, in, um, in Milan in, at the time. But it's like full of fantastical, I mean, there's angels and there's miracles and there's all sorts going on. And there's a playfulness about it that is really, really um, uplifting. And it's very, very inventive. And I hadn't seen anything like it and I haven't seen anything like it since. So I'd recommend Miracle in Milan. Thank you. So our first Q&A question is from yeah. Stephen. He's a big fan, especially of Avenue 5. And he wants oh, to know... Okay. What was the writing process like on that and how did you make it stand out from other recent shows set on a spaceship? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the writing process was slightly similar to how we did Veep. You know, I have a team of people, but for Avenue 5, I got some new writers in and I, I, I told you how I found those new writers. Because um, I'm always, um, you know, over the years as, as writers I've been working with become more successful, it gets more and more difficult to get them back to do a new season and so on. So I'm always looking for new writers who can join us and just start working up, you know, so that eventually maybe the next series they're doing a whole episode themselves and so on. Um, and I like to, we have a kind of writing room, but it's not, it's not physically a room. It's a sort of, it's just lots of conversations. And, and I just ask everyone to be very, very unpossessive. So if somebody writes a script, I say, don't spend forever on it because everything's going to change, you know, because we then swap all the scripts around and people rewrite and then people rewrite. We have another chat. We have some new ideas. They go in, people rewrite. So by the end of the day, nobody quite knows who wrote what bit. And so the scripts have all evolved organically. We get the cast in early, we rehearse, we workshop with the cast, new things emerge, that goes into the script. We send the cast away, rewrite, 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 and then we start shooting and even you know, on set. We're, we're, we're playing around. Um, trying to make it different. I'm a big fan of sci-fi, but I always like sci-fi where I didn't want to do a sci-fi where it was all aliens and teleporting and, you know, magic. I wanted to do it properly. I had to obey the laws of physics. And so I did my research. I went out to NASA and Virgin Galactic and SpaceX and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena and spoke to scientists. And, you know, so we said, you know, if a cruise ship was going into space in 40 years time. How would it work? How would it get there? How would it, you know? And they said things like, it wouldn't have much fuel. It will rely very much on taking its trajectory off the gravitational pool of various moons and planets and so on, because it just can't, you, otherwise it would just need so much fuel, there'd be no room for the passengers. They also said that to protect yourself from radiation, you will do what we do in the International Space Station, which is cocoon the whole thing in um, a wall of human feces because human waste compacted is a very good absorbent of uh, radiation. So already various plot episodes, storylines emerged, like what would happen if that <laughs> shield of human waste burst and you know what happened if you got knocked off course ever so slightly and didn't make the kind of the 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 uh slingshot round the moon and so on and what was going to be an eight-week journey turn into eventually eight years then what and that's it that's the premise after that there's very little sci-fi involved it's just 
six and a half thousand people having to come up with how their society is going to function. Oh, and by the way, a lot of the people who claim to be in charge, including Hugh Laurie's captain, Captain Ryan, the captain of the ship, turn out to be completely bogus. You know, he's just hired because he looks like a captain to provide a level of reassurance. He doesn't actually know how to fly the ship. So that's, that's, that's it's from that really. I didn't want to go too, too far into the exotic world of sci-fi. I wanted to keep it. And it's not too far in the future. So not much has changed. We, we said that, you know, when we were seeing scenes from Earth, I said, look, if you think 40 years ago, most of the streets would look roughly the same. It's not like that everything's going to be obliterated in the next 40 year, years and replaced with futuristic glass towers. You know, there'll be some of that, but there will be some old, old building. I wanted, I wanted to look more or less familiar. It's just moved on slightly because I wanted it to be grounded in a little bit of, you know, the themes of paranoia and apocalypse that are circling around us now. Um, someone asks, they're anonymous, they ask, how do you test that your comedy is funny to the masses? Um, and is it something you and your team just find funny or is it always pre-planned and you have people that you research it with? Um, uh, well, to get the um, storylines, I have researchers just to, you know, like, for vape, you know, I spoke to people who worked in politics in America, to, just to give us an idea of what happened. And, and for Avenue 5, obviously, I spoke to the scientists and so on. In terms of testing, I've, I think it's important, you know, I don't, I've never had to do um, the things like the studio testing. So I've never done a TV show for a big network where they kind of take it off you and play it to an audience who have dials that, that with charts that measure what, what's working, what isn't. Similarly with films, I've never done a big studio film where they've gone out and tested it to death. What I do do though is you know, when you're making something, you're very up close to it. So it's very difficult to stand back and be objective about it. So I show it to other people. You know, as I'm cutting it, I show it to the other writers. And then as I'm getting closer and closer, um, I show it to people who, who don't know anything about the story. If I'm doing a film, we do, you know, we, we book a screening room and we get people in, sort of friends of friends of friends. So they're sort of, you know, they, they'll be quite happy to tell you what they think but they don't really know much about the film. And I find it very useful um, because you suddenly watch it through their eyes and you suddenly get a sense of a bit that you thought was quite pacey. Actually, you watch it back and you think this is very, very slow. Um, a bit that you thought was quite clear, you think, why aren't they responding to it? And you realize you've gone and cut a vital bit of information that you just got so bored with that you hadn't really realized you'd cut it. Which, and then you realise, God, without that bit of information, the next 10 minutes doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's things like that. Um, and I think it is important to show it to people who aren't you. Um, uh, but similarly, when we're writing, I always like to write with writers. This collaborative approach, I always like to be surprised. I always like writers to come up with stuff that I wouldn't come up with because I like to be surprised. I like, you know, what's important to me is, is the final thing. I don't really mind how we get there. And, you know how much work we put into it and how who who said what and who came up with what i just want the final thing to be as good as it can be really, irrespective of who contributed because if it is as good as it can be then we'll all get the credit and, and you know that's how it should be in in that respect about response do you ever worry about political correctness and what did you think about the fact that death of stalin was banned in russia uh, it was, yeah i wouldn't say that was political correctness i think that was strangely kind of Soviet paranoia really in that we had our to, to get shown in Amer uh, in Russian cinemas you have to get given a license by the Ministry of Culture and Ministry of Culture watched the film and gave us the license so it was all set to go and then the night before somebody panicked somewhere and withdrew the license and nobody quite knows why um, mm. uh, and it was very Soviet because they then issued, the Ministry of Culture had issued a letter signed by a hundred cultural figures saying that this film was of no artistic merit whatsoever. And that was their reasoning. Um, but a weird thing to do in this day and age because you can't, you can't hide anything now. You know, once it's out there, it's out there. Um, 
so you know within a week it became the most illegally downloaded thing in russia <laughs> uh, and it had by the end of the year it had a million and a half downloads uh, and they were talking about it in the russian parliament you know they were discussing it because it had become a thing um so that was bizarre um in terms of political correctness i mean it, it's complicated because there are you know there are things that you just just because values evolve and language evolves there are things you wouldn't say now that people said 20 or 30 years ago words that were used then that you simply wouldn't use now in the same way that jokes that some jokes from 20 years ago you just think this doesn't really work now you know it just does as times change these things um and i think you have to be responsive to that uh, on the other hand i don't like the idea of people feeling they they're sort of hampered in being funny that if you made a joke about a thing people who were associated with that thing would be so offended that somehow you know the whole world would collapse because i think what you're in danger then is of um losing that sense of being entitled to have a difference of opinion um uh, you know if if i if you have a set of beliefs they should be strong enough to withstand a joke about those beliefs and if they can't withstand a joke about those beliefs then they're on a very very uh rocky foundation um uh, and also if we are going to not um end up in two kind of very distanced groups of extreme positions if we are going to have some kind of compromise the only way you can compromise is by debating the point with someone and the only way you can debate the point with someone is if you know that person isn't going to automatically shut you down for having a difference of an opinion really so that i think uh, now that is different from saying therefore you can say what you like about anything and anyone and you know when trump makes a joke and says it was just a joke can't you take a joke you know it's not that it's it's as i said it's being mindful of of what has changed over the years and what what would be is recognized by most people as being an inappropriate thing to say but that doesn't mean to say you should be banned or you should be kind of locked up or you know if you're just having a difference of agreement with someone uh, uh, i mean I, I i argued about death of stalin in that it's not belittling uh that time by making a comedy about it because i think comedy is just another means of allowing you to look at a subject from a maybe a, a slight surprising point of view um you know it allows you to examine something that maybe otherwise you might not be able to examine um, i think unfortunately that's sense. all we have time for <laughs> Um, right. thank you <laughs> thank you armand for your wonderful answers and for giving us your time and oh, to, pleasure. to everyone that asked such amazing questions we had the most questions we've ever had so sorry right. for answer your questions okay not a problem i'm sure we cover we seem to have covered quite a lot in in, in that hour so yeah it's been productive <laughs> all right okay well good luck everyone with um however your term and university life progresses in whatever form it takes Thank you very much. And to everyone else, please can you like our Facebook page for more updates and register for our next Q&A, which is with Hugh Dennis on Thursday at 4.30. And thank you again, Armando. We really appreciate it. Say hi to Hugh Dennis from me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.